Gracious Heavenly Father, I come before you once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ with boldness uh, through the access that we have to approach your throne of grace and by means of the Holy Spirit asking your continued blessings on this study as we go through your word. I just ask that you would filter out all of the foolishness but seal to the hearts of those who listen the truth of your word for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Again, uh, as we continue in our studies through the epistle to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, verse by verse, I believe this is uh, part four in that study. I think I've gone a little, maybe too quickly in the, in the first three videos, so I may... You may see me slow down just a little bit. What we learned from the beginning of this chapter, we're in chapter two, was that uh, in the first verse, we saw that the gospel that Paul proclaimed produced results. It was not in vain. I've been given some uh, thought here lately to just how important, I believe, how important that, that phrase is, not in vain. And, and uh, you know, it's as usual, I don't think that it, really that I've done justice to the text. I don't think that I ever do. I don't think any of us ever do. I believe that's why that we can go back in, in, in our study of God's Word over and over again. We'll always see something new. The gospel that Paul proclaimed, it produced results. It, it always produced results. It was never in vain. It's uh, sprinkling here in southeast Oklahoma. You, you might can even hear thunder off to, to the north in the distance. Uh, I'm trying to stay outside as much as I can. Uh, I'm just kind of tired of recording videos uh, in an enclosed room. And so if you'll bear with me, uh, I, may, I may wind up somewhere else before this video is over. But I want you to just take note of, of the fact that it was not in vain. Uh, Matthew 59, we read, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. But, let me just give you an example of what I, I think of when I, I read these words. Most of you who follow this ministry, you know what I believe the gospel is. is and that is, the, the, the gospel is what Christ has done, not what man must do. That we're born again by the will of God, not the will of the flesh. And, I, and so let me give you an example of an Armenian uh, missionary in the missionary field. And he spends some time there, perhaps a, a day or two, uh, preaching that man must do something in order to be born again. But he doesn't see any converts. There's no converts, no decisions for Christ. And he walks away feeling like that his t what he did was in vain. Which he would then conclude that, that his preaching might have been in vain. Now, I, I, I know that, I understand that some of you could argue, well, th this missionary, he knows that God's word will not return unto him void. But I think the, 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 the key words there are God's word. You know, the question is, is, are, is he preaching God's word? Because according to God's Word, it is not man's decision that determines our destiny. You know, so he, he's thinking sometimes it's, it's in vain. Sometimes it's in vain. Sometimes it's not in vain. You know, and that depending upon man's response. I do not believe that our text is teaching us in verse 1 of, chap of chapter 2 
where Paul says our, our entering in unto you, okay, was in vain uh, or not in vain. I don't believe that what he's saying there is, is that I don't believe there's any way that we can take a, away from that verse that, that, that this was an exceptional uh, incidence in which the Thessalonians, they didn't, they didn't receive his word in vain or, or their coming, Paul's, Paul and his, and his companions coming to the Thessalonians was not in vain. Uh, so the Thessalonians were, were somewhat of the, of the exception that, that it, there was a, a possibility of, of, of their coming to them uh, in vain, but this time it wasn't in vain. If you understand what I'm trying to get at here, okay? Our entrance in unto you was not in vain. It, it must mean that God was involved in the equation. That God is not some bystander awaiting a men, man's decision or awaiting for you know, men to move or decide one way or another. I believe that we can take away from that verse that the preaching of the true gospel, that being what Christ has done, his word will not return unto him void. It will not be in vain. So we saw that in verse 1. We saw in verse 2, we, we came to understand that suffering and contention or opposition, and I believe that to be the doctrines and the commandments of men, what that did was it's, it instilled a greater boldness to proclaim the gospel. In three, verses 3 and 4, we saw there were no self-serving motives. Paul wasn't there uh, for any other reason other than to preach the gospel. That God put us into service, and He's proving, He's testing our hearts to prove that they are genuine. In verse 5, God Himself is testifying to the effectiveness of His Word alone. Verse 6, no self-serving motives. Even, even given their authority as apostles. In verse 7, Paul's affection toward them as his children. And, and I, I again remind you, this is not, these are not the words of Paul. I, some of you may be tired of hearing me say this, but in, 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 in one sense, it's... it's 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 sort of a, a given. It's 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 an automatic. Most Christians understand that that these are not Paul's words. That God, that the Scripture is God breathed. Most Christians understand that. But when they're going through and studying the text, how often do they do they stop to consider as they go through the, the these verses, these these chapters, verse by verse, that it is God speaking to us. Not, not just Paul. Paul's affection toward them as, as his children, I also read as God's affection toward us as his children. If you follow what I'm saying here. I don't, I don't think that it, we're doing justice to the text if we don't see that. That God is speaking through Paul. Paul merely held the pen. In verse 8, completely... A complete giving of oneself because they were so loved. Well, how could you not see Christ in that? Verse 9, not insisting upon their, their support, their being supported, though that they were worthy of it, as to not be a burden. Verse 10, God and they both are witness. And we read the words holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. Well, does that mean that Paul and his companions uh, before the Thessalonians in the time that they were there, they never sinned? Well, they were perfect because they were holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. Well, of course not. But God, that is how God sees us, and that is what is contained within the message of the gospel that we proclaim. That we stand before God, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. That includes every single one, last one of God's children, without exception. I don't care what you've done in your past. I don't care what, what in, 
sin that you're entangled in today, if you are born again by God, you stand before God holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. And that is what I believe Paul is saying. That they were witnesses to this. To this behavior. It doesn't mean that they, they didn't have any sin in their life. Paul had, if you study Paul very much, you know that Paul had a whole lot to say about the flesh and how that the flesh profits nothing, but that we are new creations in Christ and we have a sinless new nature, that we stand before God as righteous, justified, righteous as Christ because that righteousness was imputed unto us. Verse 11, called alongside, comforted, and charged as a father does his children. The word charged. Now you would think that if God was going to charge us with something, and most Christians I think would probably believe this, that if God was going to choose one thing to charge us with, it would be something burdensome. Well, we've, we've got to do this. We've got to do that or the other thing. Law. That His primary concern would be that we keep the law. That we maintain a, a, a righteous character. That that, that that is our focus. In, in other words, just doing the best that we can. That he's going, If He's going to charge us with anything, that it would be that. But no. What does He charge us with here? To walk worthy of His kingdom and glory. Not, not to walk in a way in which we would become worthy. Well, I'm, I'm, Steve, I'm really, I don't feel like I'm all that worthy, but maybe if I walk in, in, su in such and such a way, then, then maybe God will consider me worthy. That I, that, or that I have, I'm now walking worthy of His calling. Worthy of His kingdom and glory. But man, I've got to do that. Of course, we're being charged to do something here. But it, it, we're not being charged with, with becoming holy, becoming unblameable, becoming unreprovable in God's sight. Uh, we're not being charged with becoming acceptable to God. We have been accepted in the Beloved. And we are to walk worthy of that. We, we are called saints because what? God hopes that we're, we live saintly lives? No. We're called saints because we're saints. And so we walk worthy of His kingdom and glory. You know, in, in, in uh, Thessalonica, it's, it's really hard to, today to find any footsteps of Paul there. If you read the, the literature on Thessalonica as it exists today, you won't find much trace of Paul. The new city it has been built on top of the old, so there's been little, very little archaeological exploration. There, there's, no, there's, there's no memorial churches or places com commemorating Paul's journey there. It had been under the control of the Romans who deported the local population. When Paul arrived, he found a walled city of about 65,000 people. According to Acts chapter 17, Paul visited a synagogue and he engaged the congregation in discussions about Jesus being the Messiah. This meant that there was probably a large Jewish community there at the time. Today, there is a Jewish colony there, but it's de decreased in size since the Greek occupation. In Turkish times, it was called a Jewish city. If you went there today, you'd find very few Jews. During the German occupation of, of the Second World War, most of the Jews fled and they never returned. The Nazis deported the Jews to concentration camps. As a result of Paul's preaching, a few of the Jewish men, many of the leading women 
and numerous God-fearing Greeks were persuaded by Paul's message. Gaining those converts made the community angry and jealous. So they recruited some local thugs to make trouble. They couldn't find Paul and his companions, so the mob dragged some of his followers before the authorities and accused them of turning the world upside down, acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there's another king, Jesus. And to avoid the trouble, Paul's friends helped him slip away in the night after about three weeks. Paul reminds them of their past, how that they turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. These people that lived in, in Thessalonica, their adherence to the belief systems and the ritual practices of many of the cults that were there, and there were many, it gave the people identity. It gave them meaning. It gave them value. So it's said that shifting their allegiance to serve a living and true God meant refusing to participate in that, in that intricate web of local cults that gave sacred legitimization to the empire. Now, folks, those are facts. That's not what I just read you about historically and about Thessalonica and as well as how it exists today. Those are facts, nothing made up. So I'm going to draw some comparisons here that I think you might find interesting. Well, it's hard to find any footsteps of Paul today. It's hard to find any trace of the gospel in churches today. The new city's been built on top of the old. Well, a new system of beliefs has been built on top of the original one here. There's very little archaeological exploration there in Thessalonica today. Well, there's very little interest in church history or even in study today. The memorial churches or the places commemorating Paul's journey there, uh, very few, if any. If any, I, I don't think there are any at all. Well, today there's few churches teaching what Paul taught. Paul visited a synagogue. A Jew visits a Jewish synagogue. He engages the congregation in discussions and so Paul engaged the religious establishment of his day. That's exactly what we do. He engaged his own people. There was a large Jewish community there at the time. Well, there's a large Christian community around you folks today. A few of the Jewish men, many of the leading women and, and God-fearing Greeks were persuaded by the gospel that Paul taught. Well, God has his own in places who are persuaded by the message that we proclaim. It made the community angry. It made them jealous. Well, modern Christianity feels just, just as threatened by the truth. It is jealous. It is protective of its converts. We read in history that they recruited some local thugs to make trouble. Well, Galatians 1.7, Paul states, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. They accused them of turning the world upside down, acting, acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there's another king. Well, the true gospel is viewed as disruptive to the current status quo. Paul taught the gospel as well as eschatological truth, things to come, as do we. They turn from God, or turn to God, they turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God. Well, that's just what we did. We turned from religious idol worship, primarily self, to serve a living and true God. The cults there, they gave people meaning. I, it gave people identity, meaning, and value. Well, the world, the world religious system based on human merit today does the same thing. It has the same herd mentality. It, the people receive I, I, I identity, meaning, and value in that world religious system based on human merit. Shifting their allegiance back then meant refusing to participate in all those 
that, that intricate web of local cults that, that, that gave legitimacy to the empire. Our shifted allegiance and refusal to participate in that which religion considers sacred is, is a, also a parallel. Folks, what I want you to see here is nothing has changed. If I said to you, folks, listen, listen to me. If I said to you the gospel produces results, both suffering and opposition kind of just goes right along with it. You can expect that. Don't think that there's not going to be that. But all that does is it instills a greater boldness in you to proclaim the gospel. It, it has a, a cementing, concrete, uh, you know, you're glued to that gospel. It's not going to drive opposition and, and contention and arguments and debates. That's not going to drive you away from the gospel, folks. All that's going to do, all that's really going to do is reinforce your desire to preach that gospel. Why? Because it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It isn't a message that includes self-serving motives. That God puts us into service. He puts us into service. We don't put ourselves into service. He's proving our hearts to be pure by proclaiming that gospel. That, that God Himself is testifying to the effectiveness of His Word alone. His Word alone to produce those results. If I said all these things unto you, if I said that... that, that that who we are status-wise is, is not of any consequence whatsoever. That God treats us as His beloved children, that He gives of Himself of us because He loves us so much that He'll always supply our every need. If I said to you that we stand before Him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight, that He calls us alongside Himself, He comforts us, desiring strongly, that as His children, we walk worthy of our calling because we have been made worthy. If I said to you that He's made us followers of one another, that we imitate one another, that we long for one another. If I said to you that the world religious system based on human merit persecutes us, but that this suffering accomplishes His purpose in our lives, that we're to look at that suffering as something meaningful, purposeful, and, that, and if I said to you that God's wrath, even now, right at the present time, now rests upon that legal system. If I said all that to you, it would be a summary of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. In verse 13, we, we read about Paul giving thanks in relation to God's Word being effectual in the lives of His people. Verse 14, we were made followers. That's a passive voice, folks. We were made followers. We see in, in verse 14 that, that legalism is not limited to Judaism. Okay? It can be of any people. And that there's a need for suffering. I know a lot of you are, are suffering in, in many ways. And I just want you to know that God has a purpose in that. I can't imagine what, what wonderful things God has in store for you. It's not in vain. In verse 15, we, we read this scathing rebuke of a nation, a people, a system that, that, that He set aside that persecutes us, whether they're Jewish or whether they're Irish. Okay, The persecution is the same. The persecution, the conflict, the contention is always the same. Why? Because it is a system based on human merit. And His wrath presently, at the present time, rests upon that system. It rests upon hindrance, the hindrance of, of a ministry of truth intended, which its purpose, it, it is to deliver, save those who are already His, those who are alive. Dead people are not saved. The word saved, I've, I've spent some time covering the difference between redemption and salvation. They're two, two different distinct words. In verse 16, the word saved. It's truth intended to, to deliver those who are already alive. In verse 17, God's designed uh, 
purpose for Paul. His, God designed Paul's absence from them, okay? You can't look at that any other way. You either believe in God's sovereignty or, or you don't. God designed Paul's absence, though Paul's desire to be present was very real. Very real. In verse 18, Satan only furthered God's purpose, just, just as it did with Job, just as it did with Judas. And in 19 and 20, they, the Thessalonians, were the result of Paul's suffering. Okay? Think long and hard about that. You don't suffer in vain, folks. If you preach His Word, it will be effectual. And you will not suffer in vain. Well, the rain has started to come down here in, in Monroe, Oklahoma. So I'm going to let it go with this. I'll be back again. We'll cover more of chapter 2 before we move on to chapter 3. Look, I thank you for all of your love, support, messages, encouragement. Until next time, this is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.